This is 40K Today. Lionel Johnson, Horace, Gilliman, Magnus, Corex, Mortarian. They all listen. Not Lehman Russ. He does his own. Hi there, 40K friends, and welcome to 40K Today. This is your daily 15-minute news, views, and interviews show. We cover the whole hobby of Warhammer 40,000 in... 15 minutes. I'm your host, Steve Joel, and today on the program, we meet a super fan, and I mean super. This is a man who has painted more plastic than maybe anyone else on the planet. Count up how many points worth of models you've put paint on over the past couple of years, then multiply it by 10 or 20 or 100. And the man himself, Nick Nanavati, top player and super coach, is in to give us our tip of the week. But first, there's a small matter of a mega prize giveaway. We're giving away $5,000 worth of prizes, and you can find more information at 40kprizes.com. Just for listening to this podcast, you get five entries into the contest. If you enter the keyword daily40k at 40kprizes.com, then you are in to win. All of the details are on our Facebook, and if you follow 40kprizes.com, and you've got all the information there as well. We've been running a poll on our Facebook page and looking for the answer to this question. Is proxying models in games of 40 okay, 40K okay or not okay in 40K? It's a lot of Ks. We're going to close it off now, but get this. Only 18% of people say a hard no to proxies. 82% of people in our poll say it's okay. But going on the comments, and there are a lot of comments, this is one massive qualifier for the poll. For example, Christopher says, proxying is great to play test units or armies to get a feel for them before purchasing, for example. But in a tournament setting, at the very least, models should be the correct model. And a shout out to Josh Diffie from Australia. He says, when you are building and testing a list, proxies are key and for multiple reasons. So he goes on to say it's important. Uh, for practicing with a list before building and painting or even buying. But like almost everyone who commented in the poll, he says, at tournaments, it's a different story. That's the theme for pretty much every comment. Thanks to everyone who took part in the poll. Next week's poll on Facebook is going to ask about your superstition. Lucky dice, lucky socks. Does wearing a T-shirt that matches your faction help? Uh, we'll look at how superstitious you are. Do you blame your dice when things go wrong? Okay, folks, let's introduce you to a super fan. How many models do you have on your shelf? A few thousand points worth? And of those, how many have you painted? 40K Today's John Damaris met a man who has painted more than you and me and all of our friends combined, and he's done it all in the last couple of years. Hey, Kyle. Welcome to 40K Today. And for the listeners, Kyle is a longtime friend of mine and one of my first friends that I sort of met locally playing 40K. And I would classify him as a Warhammer 40K super fan. Kyle, you want to tell them roughly how many points of painted models you have in your basement? Um, <laughs> well, thanks, by the way, for having me on. Um, the uh, total, it's 19 armies. Um I did the math at one point. My guess is it's probably uh, probably 200,000. 200,000 points of, of Warhammer 40K models, right? Yeah. So, because, it's, hard to cal it's hard to calculate because it depends how you gear them out. But the uh, the Dracari alone, I realized, were 10,000. And then uh, uh, I started doing them because I, I guess I really like Dracari. And then I, uh, I looked at some of the other armies that I built out. And I was like, oh, yeah, probably you know, some of these start to stack up. <laughs> okay, so if obviously Rome wasn't built in the day. This collection wasn't built in the day, but I think people would be sort of shocked to learn when you started 40K. How long have you been collecting models? Um, I I think I'm at the two and a half year mark. Um, I joked that um, I played back in uh, 1992, took a break, and didn't play again for uh, until 2020. So I took a 28 year hiatus, um, <laughs> and uh, and so none of that stuff really is in the collection. I, I think there's maybe a few Eldari models that translated from then, but yeah, it's been it's been a uh, uh, a passion project for about two and a half years now. So it's it's just a mere I don't know hundred thousand points a year or something like that. <laughs> and, and then the amazing thing to me is. 
it's all painted. Now, um, I wouldn't say that you're painting to win competitions. You're definitely no. going for that tabletop standard. But yep. the pro- prolific amount that you're getting painted, could you give some tips to people that that you know might help them get more painted in less time so they can get painted models on the tables or get armies that are legal for tournament play, that kind of thing? Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, that's always my goal is to get it painted uh, at a good standard and then go back and, and, you know, uh, and make them, uh, make them better. Not necessarily, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not painting at the level that other folks would be, but, um, the, I have a few key things I could say. One of which is, um, if you have free time where you can just use your hands and be thinking about or doing something else, because that's really what it's about for me is being able to set, to turn off my my brain for a little bit and instead focus really on uh, what my hands are doing. Um, I think take it, you know, take that opportunity to just uh, put in some work and give yourself discrete goals. Say, okay, I really want to finish this set of models because I know I want to play that, or I really want to finish uh, X by tonight. Okay. I'm going to go through and do that. Um, And the more you start painting things, the more of a habit becomes the faster you get. Um, I would also say, um, when you, uh, when you finish something, even if it's not perfect, put it up for people to see, because it's really going to encourage you to keep going. Um, and you know, there's nothing more exciting for an opponent than getting to, in a lot of ways than getting to play against an army that is fully painted, right? Even if it's not, even if it's not, you know, uh, you know, uh, golden demon, you know, quality, right? It's still going to look better than gray plastic on the table, and it really helps everybody's immersion, which is a big draw for the game, right? Imagining that battle in your mind as it's happening, you know, you're like, explosions are going off, last cannons are burning holes and tanks, and and I, I don't know. I see it in my mind's eye when I play, so I imagine having the painted miniatures adds a lot to that experience, which is what the game is about. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. So let's, let's ask another question. Um, so you've got one side of it. Painting that many models is, you know, just a monumental task. How do you collect that many models? Now, I know you do some a lot of things that are pretty creative in, in acquiring models. Like, what is your approach to that? Because you're not necessarily buying all that new in box, right? No, no, I don't. I, I buy a, I, the, a majority of what I get. I don't buy new in box. Um, I try my very best to support uh, stores locally, and so you know, as a rule, if I can't uh, if I can't find something. Um, and as long as it's not Forge World, I'll probably convert it. Um, for example, you know, during quarantine, I haven't been really able to acquire new things except through, you know, buying them online. And it's like, okay, well, then I'm waiting around for the box to get here. So um, I'm playing a lot of games via Zoom where I would really like to have my opponent's army on hand. Um, and so, you know, over the break, uh, I, I have, you know, you acquire that many armies, you get a lot of bits. And so then you can say, okay, I'm going to go through and I'm going to make the Sanguinar or I'm going to make, I'm going to make Astro Wrath because it's a, a, a model that, you know, if I spend some good time on it, I can really make an accurate version or maybe even something that isn't exactly what the fluff would have necessarily imagined. I want to build it this way. The other night I was, um, you know, there's just some, some models that no one is going to acquire 10 of, for example, you buy, you know, Havocs, you get one chain cannon. No one's buying ten boxes to get ten chain cannons, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I used Space Marine uh, assault cannons combined with uh, Necron uh, Necron guns combined with uh, the tops of uh, a different bit. And so, one of the things you start to get when you've acquired enough models is you start to get an inventory of kind of what you have in your bits box bits boxes and you start to figure out oh this army is like really useful for this you know uh i mentioned dracari one of the reasons i love dracari is because every box comes with like twice as many pieces as you need um and they're all really bizarre and so when you say uh uh you know uh it's i'm i'm going to use all these i'm going to remember i have this in here and this in here and i'm going to come back and revisit those. So, uh, and one of the things you can say is, you know, the more you build and convert, uh, 
the better you're going to get at it. Like my first few conversions, you know, were kind of, kind of trash. I, I eventually got rid of most of those, but you know, uh, m- now my Sanguinar looks pretty much like a Sanguinar, right? So that's, uh, that's yeah. amazing. So yeah, thanks for taking the time to join us, Kyle, and, and giving us an idea. And we'll put some pictures of your collection, you know, on, on our social and, uh, let people just see like what I would call the insanity, but I, I appreciate you and I respect you, right? Cause oh, no, you um, can call it insanity and still respect me. That's just so absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, sir. That's Kyle McCord, a genuine Warhammer 40 K super fan. So next up on the program, if you're looking forward to getting back into playing the game or maybe getting some tabletop simulator games in, the man who coaches the coaches, the super coach, the king of coaches, the first coach, the coach who needs no introduction, but in a second, we'll give him one anyway. Today's episode of 40K Today is brought to you by Frontline Gaming. Frontline Gaming is a one-stop shop for all your Warhammer hobby needs, discounted products, American-made gaming mats and terrain, and a full line of miniatures painting service and daily hobby content. And this can all be found at FrontlineGaming.org. Welcome back. Every week on a Friday, we like to get one tip, just one tip from a top player or a coach that we can work on over the weekend or whenever we get a chance to play again. The idea is that even though not many folks are getting games in at the moment, there's still time to learn and improve and practice. So this week, we've brought out the big guns, our guest coach, with the tip of the week is none other than the father of Art of War, the pioneer of 40K coaching, Mr. Nick Nanavati. John Damaris asked him for a tip. Nick Nanavati, the man, the myth, the legend. Welcome back to 40K Today. Let's talk about coaching tips. What would be your best tip for somebody who wants to get more competitive at the game during a time in which it's very difficult to play? That's a great question, John. One I answer all the time uh, over in Art of War on my coaching program. Um, you don't have to be playing to be practicing. I say it probably multiple times a week to my clients. But reading up on your codexes, scouring the internet, becoming a member of the war room, all that is great ways to increase your game knowledge. And one of the places most people struggle in 40K is game knowledge. There's just so many rules out there. So how do you how do you go to a tournament and properly play against something you have no clue what it does? You don't. The way you do that is by trying to understand the army before you get to the table. Now that's cumbersome, and it's also daunting. There's so many rules out there. No one's got time to just read all of it. And there's so much misinformation on the internet that how do you know what to what is good information, what's bad information? I think the number one thing you can do to improve right now if you're not able to play games is literally sit down, open up a codex for an army you don't even play. Like if you're a Harlequin player, open up an Orc book. If you're a Chaos player, open up a Space Marine book, something like that. And sit down and try to... Look at it with a fresh set of eyes as if it was the first time you knew anything about that army. Don't look at it with the internet advice like someone tells you Iron Hands feel on pain is really good. Look at it with a, a real fresh set of eyes and try to come up with combos and strategies just like you would as if GW released that codex today. And then open it just the first same time that everyone else does and try to see those different synergies and combos and correlations. And try to build an army list. I know even it, it sucks if you're not interested in that faction, believe me. I don't like writing lists for all the different factions either, but it's just something that you've got to do to stay up on top of your game. So write a list for that faction. Really try to understand what combos they're trying to do, what kind of synergies they're trying to do, and all that kind of stuff. It will give you a real appreciation for your opponent's army when you do come across on the table. So let me give you an example. Thousand Suns are a very psychic-heavy force, and they have lots of bonuses to cast and 10 million powers. And from the opponent's perspective, for someone who doesn't know Thousand Suns in depth, it just seems like they have it never stops casting. You have no idea who knows what spell, and everything's bonus to cast, and everything just always goes off, and everything works perfectly. That's not how the Chaos players actually work. That's not how playing Thousand Suns works from their side, their perspective. To really understand it, you need to go into their perspective. How do you get those different bonuses to cast? How do you know which guy? They have three different tables in that book. How do you know which guys can carry, take which powers? Um, Similar for Eldar on their psychic phase, they just break all the rules. Or sisters and their miracle dice, no one knows how that crap works. Try to really dive deep and put yourself in the player shoes of who's playing that army. And that'll give you a much better understanding of what your opponent needs to have happen in order for his strategy to work. And then you can start throwing wrenches into his plans, start actually making them harder so you can win your games. So really just put yourself in your opponent's shoes, try to come up with an army, try to approach a new army with a fresh set of eyes, and really just dive into the synergies and the strategies that the other guy is trying to do to you. 
Okay, that's really cool, Nick. So let me ask you this. Taking this a step further, and I, this is maybe a little more advanced topic, but I think with the invention of TTS, it's maybe more doable than ever. But would you recommend people just play other armies to sort of get an idea, to get Absolutely. into the head? Of, so before yeah. I had a vast collection of armies, because 40K became my full-time job, I, um, I would proxy models uh, with my friends who also were just competitively like-minded, so they didn't mind. So we, so we could get experience with other factions that we would otherwise never play. You know, growing up, I only had like four or five guys I played with on the regular, and we'd each have like our own one or two factions. So there was a huge, large faction gap. Like none of us had orcs, for example. So every now and then, I would do exactly this. I would try to make work lists that I thought were unique and creative and really making use of cool orcs synergies, put it on the table, learned what worked, learned what didn't, and that's how I learned how to play as orcs and stuff. With Tabletop Simulator, you will live in this wonderful land called the 21st century where you don't have to proxy, and you don't even have to be in the same room as somebody. You can just play an army you've never played before, so really get the feel for it. That's taking a step further for sure. You know, actually, even take it a step further, If <laughs> especially 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 in this this day and age you can actually play against yourself i don't know if you've ever done that um i've done it occasionally it's very hard because you have to be unbiased uh as best you can be and that's difficult because obviously you're play testing your own work list versus this theoretical elder army that you just wrote you want your works to win they're your faction and you're trying to prove that you can win you're trying to win that match but if you can successfully remove yourself from that equation it is a great way to learn about that other faction well one of the one of the things i like about playing with myself, please don't take that out of context, is um, <laughs> is the fact that even even with my institutional knowledge of my plan, right, when I'm playing against myself, I know what I'm trying to do. Um, it makes the game harder to win, but it also allows, your, it allows you to play a game where your opponent makes all the moves to foil you. <laughs> and it kind of sort of gives, a, gives you an idea of how resilient your plan is. Now, it's not perfect. It, it's not a... It's not something that I do often, but it is a way to learn matchups because you can kind of learn what's important. Because a lot of times you'll play a game and until you play a matchup a few times, you don't really, really understand what the important parts of that matchup are, right? Yeah, absolutely. You need to you need to really kind of dive deep into the match. And usually matches have to be played two or three times by the top players to really understand all the nuances of how those two armies interact. So Playing yourself, line ball might not be perfect. It's really good for getting those early reps in. All right. Well, there you heard it here for, for first. <laughs> Nick's uh, Art of War coaching tip, play with yourself. All right. <laughs> That's Nick Nanavati speaking with John Damaris at artofwar40k.com. Uh, and the links to his coaching service and his range of coaches that work with him the link is in our show notes for you right now. Before we say goodbye, it's time for the model of the day. The, the model of the day, the, the model of the day, the, the model of the day. How about that song? Today's model of the day is Belisarius Call in bright yellow. Uh, David Koshka is an artist from Buffalo in New York who loves to kitbash and create. His call has a heap of unique features from the big standout warp eye face thing right in the middle of it all. I don't even know what you call that, but it's blue and it's beautiful. To the upturned legs, to the massive uh, mohawk headdress, to the basing, which allows the model to look like it's rearing up on its back legs. Oh, and did I mention it's bright yellow? Check out the super cool model of the day on our Insta and Facebook pages, as well as on our YouTube video uh, and our link direct to Koska's in uh, Instagram is in our show notes right now. As always, if you have a model that you want us to feature on the show or if you've seen a model that should feature on the program, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And that's it for today. Thanks for joining us. A big thank you to our content producer, Alex Bainter, and our social media was Tanya Gates and our technical producer, Seamus Ronan, for all of their hard work in putting the program together. If you have anything that you think we should feature on the show, please get in touch. Contact us via Facebook. Just search 40K today. And uh, make sure you join us next week. We have a packed lineup for you as Archon Scari breaks down the new Harlequin rules in our faction focus, and we meet a man whose name is on the wall of heroes at Warhammer World. Does it get cooler than that? Uh, also, tomorrow, don't forget to tune in to hear our best of the week. You can download it via the Frontline Gaming Network or via your favourite podcast player. So we'll see you tomorrow. Until then, for the 40K Today team, 
I'm Steve Joel, and that's what's happening in 40K today.